Good afternoon. Even though most of the viruses on the planet are harmless to us, there are some that cause serious disease. And the best way to prevent that is to vaccinate against them. Next time we'll talk about what to do if you're not vaccinated and uh, want to treat an infection, we can use antiviral drugs. By the way, what is the one viral infection that you can treat after you get it by vaccination? Please. Hallelujah. <laughs> you have listened. Wonderful. Our longevity has increased since the 1900s, substantially, our life expectancy. Uh, from the 1900s, about 50 years old, to today, you know, between 70 and 80 years old. And I will claim that that's all because of science. Does anyone want to object? No, good, excellent. Science and technology has done this. Things like public health measures, improvements in medicines, but also medications of various sorts, uh, antiviral drugs and vaccination. So today we'll talk about vaccination, which basically uses your immune system to prevent infections. It gives you memory so that it works whenever you get infected. And in the end, of course, Vaccination breaks the chain of transmission that you need for a virus to spread from one individual to another. We've encountered this slide before. It's the immune response. And this is exactly what vaccines do. Remember, you have an infection. Here on the left, we're looking at time and days and years after infection versus antibody or T cell levels. First infection, you, within about uh, 14 days or so, 21 days, you have an immune response. Of course, the antibody response is too late to protect you. The cellular response helps you to recover. And if you recover, you then have protective immunity for many years. You have memory, as we talked about before. And then if you become infected later on or with an agent that you are immunized against, you have a very rapid and robust immune response that prevents infection. So the antibodies will, those designed high affinity antibodies will have been stored and they can respond very quickly to prevent infection. So a natural infection does this, and of course, vaccines do this as well. The first vaccine that we recognize, there were probably earlier ones, but this is the one historically recognized, was made by Edward Jenner in 1796. Of course, then we didn't know anything about bacteria or viruses, but we knew that certain diseases seemed to be transmitted from person to person, and when people got certain diseases, like smallpox, which is already rampant by now, if they, if they survived, they never got it again. So people began to put two and two together. Uh, Jenner uh, recognized that milkmaids who milked cows in the UK, they would get cowpox, a mild rash on their hands. But they never got smallpox. So what he did was to take a few pustules of uh, the cowpox lesion and inoculate a young boy with them. He waited two weeks perfect amount of time, and then he challenged the boy with smallpox. Now, this was not an FDA-approved clinical trial. <laughs> Nevertheless, it went ahead. And of course, you could not even come close to doing such a thing nowadays. You cannot inoculate people with virulent viruses. <coughs> if you wanted to make a vaccine against a, a nasty virus, you can do that, but then you have to send people out in the world to presumably get infected with those nasty viruses. <coughs> well, this young boy was protected. And so from that point on, his practice was used more and more. Uh, before we stopped immunizing against smallpox, we used to deliver it in a similar way as Jenner did. He scraped the material into the skin of the boy. Uh, he used, we, now, we used a bifurcated needle that holds a small drop of vaccine. You scarify the outer layer of skin. The virus, vaccinia virus, replicates really well in the skin cells. And as I told you once before, the process of scarification induces inflammation, which makes the vaccine response, uh, the immune response, even better. Uh, in 1885, many years later, uh, Louis Pasteur in, in France developed the rabies vaccine, and he called it a vaccine in honor of Jenner because vaca means cow in Latin. And the th then the next vaccines were developed in the 1930s, yellow fever vaccine, uh, influenza, all the way to the present. Now, just after Jenner developed his vaccine, the anti-vaxxers came out. This is a, a woodcut from uh, around that time. The cowpox or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation. The publication of the Anti-Vaccine Society. 
So you can't argue that the anti-vaxxers flourish now because of the internet. Because there, I submit to you there was no internet when this woodcut was carved. People will always be able to get information. So people thought that if they took Jenner's vaccine, they would grow cow parts from their skin or wherever they got the vaccine. So the first vaccine, the first anti-vaxxers, which of course continues to this day. Despite their protestations, vaccines are incredibly successful. In particular, large-scale vaccination campaigns have worked really well. The campaign against polio, which we'll talk of today in some length, was initiated in the 1950s. We used to have 20 to 30 to 40,000 cases of paralytic polio a year. That is gone now from the US, 1979, the last case of polio as a result of two vaccines inactivated in oral, which we'll talk about measles. Same thing, vaccine in, uh, introduced in the 60s, as we discussed earlier, could eliminate measles from the US if everyone got it, if everyone got their kids immunized, but there are still pockets of unimmunized kids that don't get the vaccine, hence we have outbreaks now and then. Measles in particular, is striking the effect of the vaccine. Here on the right is a graph showing the um, number of deaths prevented by measles vaccination from 2000 to 2012. <coughs> so you can see the top line is the estimated deaths in the absence of vaccination going from 0.7 to 14 million a year globally. These are measles deaths. And on the bottom are the deaths with vaccination See, and, the, and the bars are how many have been prevented. Millions and millions of deaths prevented. We actually mentioned that uh, earlier. We use vaccines in all sorts of our lives now. We immunize children. We even immunize adults. We immunize our pets. We even immunized wild animals. We drop bait into the woods to try and immunize them against rabies. And many childhood diseases are rare. I grew up in a time where there was always measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, polio, smallpox, they're all gone now. And in fact, many people use as an argument, I don't want to vaccinate my kid because there are no infectious diseases around. <laughs> I hope none of you think that way because it's not really logical. Uh, so diseases are rare, but that's a first world thing because we're the ones who use vaccines and distribute them. Many diseases are still prevalent in other countries like rubella and measles because no one is paying for the vaccines to distribute them. No one is training people to distribute them. Or there's conflict, as we see in the case of polio, that prevents people from immunizing. This is a real tragedy because we have vaccines that work. Every kid in the world should get them. I'm of a strong belief that when we develop technology, no matter where it is in the world, it should be shared. We're all human beings, and especially things that save lives. And I still don't understand why we can't do that. Let's talk a little bit about how vaccines work uh, in the world. They work by maintaining a level of immunity. You don't have to immunize everyone, as you'll see, but you immunize enough to provide what we call herd immunity. Okay, herd immunity, you immunize a population, not everyone, but you immunize enough to stop transmission of the virus. It has nothing to do with cows. Every time I lecture to medical students about this, I say herd immunity, they all moo in unison. What is herd immunity? Uh, it is immunizing a fraction of the population so that the likelihood of infection drops. You have a room of 100 people, and maybe for the virus you can immunize 70 of them, and that would be enough to prevent transmission, because the likelihood that the virus is going to find a susceptible host is so de decreased, it's not going to happen anymore. So that threshold in, a, in 100 people, whether it's 20 or 100 or 90, depends on the virus and the population as well. And here are some numbers. For smallpox, you need to immunize between 80 and 85% of the population to stop transmission, measles 93 to 95%. And that's not easy to do because no vaccine is 100% effective. No vaccine, if given to 100 people, will result in antibody responses in 100 people. That's just the way it is. It's possibly a genetic issue. It's possibly an issue with the vaccine as well. And so because of that, for example, when you uh, immunize 80% of the population with measles vaccine, only 76% is immune. And we don't always check this, but in the beginning when we release a vaccine, we, we do, and that's how we know those numbers. Public complacency is a big problem with vaccine programs. These kinds of statements, which many of you uh, may recognize, make serious problems for large-scale vaccination programs. 
people say silly things. I don't really understand. I'm not injecting anything into my body. Okay. Well, this is a problem for all of society, not just for you. And I'm sure this person is injecting something into his or her body. It just not, might not be a vaccine. None of these are really logical. None of them are logical. I, get the, I, got, I never get flu. It's just, it's just not true. Polio is long gone, but it will not stay long gone unless you keep vaccinating. So keep these in mind. And if anyone says something to you like this in the next 10 years, please say something. Have something in mind to counter them. The best way, of course, is to remain calm and not get angry or say you're an idiot. That doesn't help. <laughs> but think of something logical and maybe explain why vaccines have worked, as you, as you will learn today. Vaccines have to be publicly accepted, but there are always groups of people who get together and decide on their own that the vaccine is not working. These anti-vaxxers tend to, tend to occur in communities. So here's, here's a map of some incidents in the U.S., uh, the the uh, cases not tied to religious communities, those are the orange ones. Uh, orange can, cases with uh, confirmed measles cases, and red cases tied to unvaccinated uh, members of religious communities. So here, uh, all 58 measles cases in Brooklyn uh, involved unvaccinated members of an Orthodox Jewish community. So these individuals all talk to each other and say, yeah, we, we don't want to get this vaccine. So they got an outbreak of measles. 23 measles cases in a largely unvaccinated Hare Krishna community in North Carolina. Here's one that really I really love. The senior pastor of Eagle Mountain Church in Newark, Texas, was critical of measles vaccination, and at least 12 people infected in the congregation did not get the vaccine. The hell is this guy being critical? Did he ever take a science course of any kind? Or do you just have a feeling from reading something on some internet site? And people listen to pastors, as you know. Religious leaders have a lot of influence. So if the pastor gets up at the pulpit and says, measles vaccine causes autism, a lot of people are going to listen to him, even though it's a stupid statement to make. So this happens often where you have these outbreaks in communities where people are influencing one another. First question, herd immunity. A, demonstrates the importance of immunizing livestock. B emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect the population. C emphasizes that everyone must be immune to protect the population. D describes how groupthink can dominate anti-vaccine choices, E all of the above. All right, the answer is B emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect a population. Obviously, it's not everyone must be immune, so C can't be right. <laughs> groupthink has nothing to do with, with herd immunity in, in this way anyway. And who answered livestock? <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit more about how vaccines work. All right, vaccines are active or passive. In an active vaccine, which we're going to talk about for most of today, you put a pathogen in a person or something derived from the pathogen that induces immunity to disease. So you either infect someone with an infectious virus or a, a subunit, as we will see, and that gives you long-term protection. It gives you memory. Passive vaccines are when you give antibodies to people. This, in theory, could be antibodies or immune cells, but we don't have any passive vaccines at the moment that involve immune cells. We may well have in the future. Uh, the best example is the rabies uh, antibodies. Here is a, a vial of rabies immune globulin. These are polyclonal antibodies purified from people who have been immunized with rabies vaccine. And of course, they're screened to make sure there's nothing else in them. These don't last very long, a few months at best. Soon they'll be replaced by monoclonal antibodies that have been engineered to last longer uh, and be specific. But at the moment, they're, they're still short. Even the monoclonals will be short-term protection. We use these when someone is bitten by what we think is a rabid animal. While we're giving them the course of rabies vaccines, we give them uh, immune globulin at the bite site to help neutralize some of the virus. So it's injected wherever the, the animal has bitten you, you get rabies immune globulin. There's also, uh, of course, when you're born, you get a, a passive vaccine from your mother. We, I think we've mentioned this before. Uh, as you're developing in utero here, conception to birth, as you're developing, you're acquiring antibodies from your mother. Uh, and then as you're born, you have a complement of IgG that reflects your mother's infection. And so if you, were, you encounter a, a virus in those early months, you can be protected. But the maternal antibodies decline rapidly. Uh, by nine months. Of course, you're then making your own, although you don't have any 
maybe in history in your own. You have to be infected to get that. Another passive vaccine that is experimental, it's not available, is, the, is ZMAP. This is just the first one that was made uh, for Ebola virus, and it was used in the 2015 West outbreak in West Africa. Many, many other companies now are making uh, monoclonal antibodies against Ebola virus. Here's Ebola virus, filamentous virus with a glycoprotein on the left. Uh, what they did was to make virus-like particles of, of Ebola virus, so they're not infectious. You don't have to grow them in a BSL-4 facility. Immunize mice, uh, identify monoclonal antibodies against the virus, then humanize them. In other words, take, replace everything except the variable reason with human sequences in the antibody so it won't be, it won't uh, cause an immune response itself uh, when given to people. And then they may actually make it in tobacco plants. It's very cheap and you can make a lot in tobacco plants. Uh, and then uh, these, these were given to some people during the outbreak. It's not clear whether they worked or not, but they've, uh, they've since been expanded in, by other companies. And these are the three monoclonals that make up ZMAP. It's a cocktail of three, and they bind to different parts of the viral uh, glycoprotein. Another nice uh, example of passive therapy, uh, Lassa fever virus emerged in the 60s in Africa. Uh, nurse missionaries who were working there were getting sick and dying. One of them, Penny Pinio, was, was airlifted back to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in the 60s. She was just put on a passenger plane sitting there with everybody else because we didn't know any better back then. But she recovered in the hospital, and uh, not because anyone did anything in particular, just luckily recovered. They took some of her serum and stored it. And then uh, Jordi Casals was a virologist at Yale who happened to live in Upper Manhattan. He commuted every day. He got sick because he was mouth pipetting it in the lab, uh, and they put him into Columbia Presbyterium. They gave him serum from the nurse and it, and it presumably saved his life because he recovered. So that's a cool story, which is told in this book, which I've shown you before, the book that made me a, a virologist. So what do we need to make an effective vaccine? We're, we're back to active vaccines now. You've got to have a good immune response. And if you know whether it's Th1 or Th2, the vaccine has to duplicate that. If you know whether in an infection, Protection is mediated by Th1 or Th2 responses. You have to duplicate that for the vaccine. So you have to know what we call the correlates of protection. Is it antibody or is it cells? Uh, the individual has to be protected against disease by a virulent form of the pathogen. So you can't just get enough. You can't just make antibodies in response to the vaccine. They have to be shown to protect you. And to do that, you need to do a clinical trial. And that means the virus has to be circulating. So right now there's no Ebola virus outbreak, so you can't test an Ebola virus vaccine. So that's a problem. We can test Zika vaccines now because it is circulating. Some of the requirements of a vaccine that should be safe, of course, it has to be very different from the wild type virus. It can't cause the same kind of disease. It has to give you protective immunity in the population, long lasting. Although as you'll see today, the flu vaccine that we use isn't terribly long lasting, but we're working on fixing that. And it has to be cheap, less than a buck, according to WHO. They say if you want us to use these vaccines globally, they have to be less than a buck each. They have to be genetically stable. For infectious attenuated vaccines, um, they can't revert, as, as you will see. Storage, so far, all the vaccines we've made have to be frozen. And this is a problem, because in parts of the world, there aren't freezers. In fact, for parts of the WHO polio eradication efforts, they've developed kerosene-fired freezers that they can put on the backs of horses and carry into remote areas, keep the vaccine frozen. Well, that's going to change. We're not going to have to freeze our vaccines in the next 10 years or so. And then delivery is really important. We have very few vaccines that are currently orally deliverable, which is very easy. Nobody minds drinking a little fluid, but you put a needle in front of a kid, they freak out, even some adults. So it's tough to do injections, plus people need to be trained to, to give needle injections. And so you have to have healthcare personnel to do that. Let's talk about the different kinds of vaccines that we make nowadays and how they work. So we start in all cases with a, a virus which, for which we identify a medical need. All right, that means it causes significant disease in enough people to make it uh, important to protect it. So if there are five cases a year uh, globally of a particular virus, never going to have a vaccine against that. Right? You hope that you could develop some antivirals, perhaps, to resolve infection, but not a vaccine. Take the virus, and then you can do a number of things with it. 
You can attenuate it. You can make it less virulent by introducing mutations into its genome. We make this a replication-competent va virus vaccine. We can inactivate infectivity with chemicals, make an inactivated vaccine, which is then injected. We can break up the virus into components and purify components and only inject them. These three are traditional ways of making virus vaccines. We'll give you some examples of these today. More recently, with the advent of recombinant DNA and molecular cloning, we can take viral antigens that we believe to be pro protective. We can clone them, the genes encoding them. So for example, we could put those genes into a different virus vector and deliver them to individuals. We're developing virus vectors that can be delivered to people and are safe, and we can put various viral antigens in them. We can also inject people with DNA. Turns out that when you put DNA right into the muscle, it's picking up, it's picked up by antigen presenting cells, translated, the protein is made and is very immunogenic, DNA vaccines. And then we can produce the proteins from uh, the gene and bacteria, yeast, insect cells. We can make individual proteins which can be injected or sometimes these proteins, if they're a capsid protein, will assemble into a virus-like particle. So let's look at some examples of these. Here's a list of uh, some of the vaccines that are licensed in the US. I think it's pretty much up to date. We have a lot of vaccines here. Many of them are for travelers, for military recruits like adenovirus vaccines are only given to the military because when they get together, the recruits, they, they have outbreaks of adenoviruses here. Hep A is a traveler's vaccine. Uh, yellow fever is another travel vaccine. What do I mean by a traveler's vaccine? If you go somewhere where there's yellow fever, there's no yellow fever in the US, you don't need to have a yellow fever vaccine if you're gonna stay here. But if you go to parts of Brazil, for example, you need to get a yellow fever vaccine. Um, and we have vaccines that are universal in children. All right, so these are vaccines that every kid has to get in order to go to school. Otherwise, they're not supposed to go to school. That's what universal means. Measles, mumps, rubella, which are all given together. Uh, varicella, chickenpox vaccine. And we have, of course, the shingles vaccine, where it's only given to older people who have already had chickenpox and they're at risk uh, for shingles. Anyway, you can see we have quite a, a few of them here. All right, inactivated vaccines, you take the virus, which is infectious, and you treat it with chemicals to make it no longer infectious, but you maintain its antigenicity. And these were the first, some of the first vaccines developed in the 30s, the first influenza vaccine. Pester's vaccine. These were developed by inactivating with chemicals like formalin or other detergents, making sure the virus is inactivated, and then you inject it and make sure it gives rise to uh, antibody production. And one, I want to tell you uh, of, of just a couple of these as examples, and one is against polio, which we've mentioned a bit in this course, but this of course is a paralytic disease. The name comes from Greek and Latin roots, and I like this quote from a 1959 textbook of medicine, a common acute viral disease. Is it common today? No, it's less than 30 cases globally. But at one time it was common, in the 50s in particular. Uh, febrile illness, sore throat, headache, and vomiting. Uh, in many cases, a lower paralysis develops. So that's a textbook of medicine. When you go to medical school, some of you look for polio. You won't find it in your textbook of medicine anymore. In the US, polio, 20, 30, 40,000 cases, paralytic cases a year. Hospitals were full of iron lungs, because not only could you lose your limb function, but you, you could use, lose the ability to breathe. Your respiratory muscles would be paralyzed. You'd be put in an iron lung, which would breathe for you. None of these are left except in museums. Uh, there are a couple of interesting specimens in museums around the world. I saw one on eBay a couple of months ago for sale for about 80 grand. Um, so these are historical artifacts. Um, because polio is gone, we don't do this anymore. Uh, polio, of course, is caused by the virus of the same name, which we have talked about as our model plus stranded RNA virus. Uh, FDR had polio. He got it in his 20s. He could not walk without braces and a wheelchair or crutches. And this was very frustrating to him. Amazing that he was elected president uh, four terms. I guess that either we were more tolerant back then or because we had no television, no, but a lot of people maybe didn't even know he couldn't walk. I don't know if that would have been the same had there been TV. Anyway, he raised funds. He started the uh, National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, and, and the, he raised money to make the two polio vaccines we use today, the 
March of Dimes, which still exists today, they now study birth defects, was his fundraising operation where he had kids send dimes to the White House in envelopes. Can you imagine doing that today? Yeah, well, they wouldn't because it would be a threat. However, he raised $500 million in those days, and, and he paid for a lot of the research on polio, which we use to make the vaccines that we use today. The first vaccine candidate was an inactivated vaccine, polio treated with formalin. It was given a big clinical trial in 1954, 1.8 million children. It's the biggest clinical trial ever done. Never going to come close to that again. It had around 50% protection. So what would happen is you, they took all these kids and they took some of them and gave them polio vaccine and some of them a placebo. And then they sent them out in the world. And then a year later, they said who got polio and who didn't and of the vaccinated in the control group. Okay, so the vaccine was 50% protective. Uh, it was licensed on April in 1955. And then it started to be given out to people. Lots of headlines uh, here in New York City. These are the New York papers. You can see it was a big deal. Unfortunately, within about a month or so, or a couple of months of release of this vaccine, there were cases of polio associated with vaccination. It turns out that what they had done is had a number of different pharmaceutical companies make lots of vaccine, and then on licensure, they were all released. And one of the companies in California, Cutter Laboratories, they didn't follow the protocol properly. And uh, so they had infectious virus in the batches of vaccine, and a number of kids got infected from that. This is it's a really good book by Paul Offit, who was a, uh, a vaccinologist at Penn. He wrote all about it, if you're interested. Really, really good stuff. And this revitalized the anti-vaccine movement, of course. Eventually, they cleaned up this issue, um, and they resumed immunization. Cutter Labs now makes inse insect repellent. That's the lab. If you buy Cutter, it's the stuff you want to keep mosquitoes away. They don't make polio vaccine anymore. So this is what happened with polio in the US. Uh, inactivated, introduced in 1955. It dropped down the cases to a few thousand a year by the 60s. The way it works, you're injected in the muscle with the vaccine. You develop antibodies in the blood. Uh, if you are challenged with polio virus, which you do by uh, ingesting fecally contaminated material, the virus will replicate in your intestines. You will shed virus. It will enter your blood. But once it reaches the blood, antibodies induced by IPV will neutralize it. So you can still shed polio when you have IPV and spread it to others. So you have to have very high coverage in a population. The next inactivated vaccine, influenza, which we've also mentioned, our model for a negative stranded RNA virus, this one with a segmented genome. It's enveloped, of course. Um, there are three types of influenza, A, B, and C. We largely uh, immunize against A and B. Uh, the reason we do immunize against influenza is because there are substantial deaths uh, each year. This is an average over the last 30 years or so, 3,000 to 49,000 deaths a year. So we make a number of vaccines. The main one, which was originally developed, actually Jonas Salk, who made the polio vaccine, first worked on the very first flu vaccine. You take virus grown in eggs, uh, you inactivate it with formalin, and then that's injected into people. We make about 75 to 100 million doses every year in the US. We use a lot of eggs, one egg per dose. Next time you get a flu shot, just think that's one egg worth of virus going into your arms. About 60% effective in kids and adults under 65. But once you get over 65, the efficacy goes down and its durability goes down as well. As I said before, older people who get it after a year or so, they have no more immunity and they have to be immunized every year. When you in, immunize people with this vaccine, you're inducing antibodies against the, the glycoproteins of the virus, the HA uh, and the NA. Now, for many years, people with uh, egg allergies were told not to take this vaccine. It's made in chicken eggs, feathers, uh, egg proteins, and so forth. But now we have a number of vaccines made in cell culture uh, that, uh, that get around that. So we have this one, flu cell vax, and a number of others as well. Now, the problem with flu, of course, is that the envelope proteins change every year. And every year, we have to pick new strains to be incorporated into the vaccine. Every year, just to make sure that the strain hasn't changed enough. And we take, if we decide, and I'll show you in a moment how that's done, if we decide that um, the strain has changed enough in that year, we have to incorporate it into a new vaccine. We make reassortants with a strain that's known to grow well in eggs, because most clinical isolates do not. And then we produce a vaccine from it. The 2017-18 vaccine, so that if you 
in the Northern Hemisphere, if you go starting in August or September, you can get the 2017-18 vaccine. It's going to have an A influenza virus. Uh, it's going to an H1N1. It's going to have an A H3N2, and these refer to the antigenicity of the HA and the NA, and then a B type virus from uh, Brisbane 2008. So the nomenclature is simply A or B, where it's isolated, some isolate number, and then the year of isolation. So the WHO maintains a global network of laboratories which do year-round surveillance in the northern and southern hemisphere because their flu seasons are opposite. And they get isolates from people and they look at what's circulating and they try and decide whether the vaccine has to change. It's a very complicated process outlined here. At, in the beginning of the year, January, the, the WHO has to, and the CDC uh, selects strains. They have to prepare reassortants to grow them in eggs. They grow them up in eggs, standardize the antigen. They, they make sure it's the right potency. There's enough antigen present uh, that gets licensed, formulated, tested, and packaged. And then by the end of August, you're ready to vaccinate people. And that's where you can go to CVS and you see the sign out front, get your flu vaccine for 12 bucks. It's been worked on uh, since January. Now I interviewed one of the people who's on the uh, committee to uh, choose this vaccine, and that was that TWIV 4, 413, Stacy Schultz Cherry. I think I interviewed her in January, and I said, and she said the vaccine was going to be announced in March. I said, can you tell us what it is? And she said, no, I would have to kill you if I did. <laughs> it was a big secret. But anyway, it's a very interesting process. Now, again, the problem is every year the flu virus is mutating and changing its antigenicity. The HA protein in particular, the glycoprotein changes, and these colored residues on this model of the HA are those, or these are the antigenic sites. Uh, these are the sites against which antibodies are made. And the ones on the top here uh, are mainly the ones elicited by uh, the vaccine. And one amino acid change at any of these sites is enough to make the vaccine less effective because the antibodies induced by it won't neutralize the virus as well. We call this antigenic drift Virus is continually changing. And this is pretty unusual. Most viruses don't do this. A few others do, and we'll talk about them later. But, you know, polio doesn't undergo antigenic drift, measles doesn't. So we use one vaccine for those forever. It's great. We've been using the same polio and measles vaccines forever. But here we have to change the vaccine frequently because of this, and it's a problem. So people want to make universal flu vaccines. And these epitopes on the stem of the HA, these don't change that much because they're conserved, and so people are thinking maybe these would be a good way to do that. All right, so those are two examples of inactivated vaccines. Let's do a question. Which statement about inactivated viral vaccines is wrong? Chemicals can be used to inactivate infectivity. They do not replicate. They can be dangerous if an activation is not complete. Antigenic variation can make them ineffective. None of the above are incorrect. Now the answer is E, none of the above are incorrect, they're all right. Chemicals can be used, they do not replicate, they can be dangerous. If an activation is not complete, that was the Cutter incident. Antigenic variation can make them ineffective. Subunit vaccines, you take a virus particle, you can break it up into components, purify them and immunize them, or you can produce the protein by recombinant uh, DNA methods. It's the modern way and give those to people as well, you can do that in a variety of hosts nowadays, not just bacteria, yeast, insect cell, cell culture. And usually we use a capsid or a membrane protein to do this. Here's an example of a subunit vaccine just recently approved for influenza virus. It's called flu block. And this, uh, what we do here is we take the gene encoding the flu HA protein, the glycoprotein, we express it in insect cells using an insect virus vector called a baculovirus. And the reason these are used is because these have really strong promoters and they're not human cells and you can make lots and lots of protein. So they do these in huge fermenters. This big tank is full of cells making uh, HA. You don't have to use serum either, by the way. Insects don't need serum. Then you purify the protein. Here it is shown, these little rosettes. That's purified HA. And then you make it into a vaccine. This is very quick. It's been approved for 18 to 49 year olds. It's injected. That's an example of a brand new flu um, subunit vaccine. Another one, uh, hepatitis B virus vaccine. Uh, this is a good one. This has been made by producing the hepatitis B virus surface antigen protein. 
That's the protein that makes up this, this outer uh, shell. Remember, this is an envelope virus, and, and these are proteins embedded in the envelope, which you can just see there in pink. And in, in the middle is the capsid with the, with the uh, gapped DNA genome. So the surface antigen makes up uh, the outer, it's basically the embedded in the membrane protein. And that protein is produced in yeast. And it, when it's made in yeast, it assembles into empty particles like those shown on the right here, these elongated ones or these small ones. No genome in them, just pure, pure protein. So this is nice. You don't have to worry about infectivity. And those are injected into people, and um, they're quite immunogenic. So it's a cancer vaccine because, as you remember, hep B can cause liver cancer, and that's the main reason why you don't want to be infected with it. Another cancer vaccine is against the human papillomaviruses. These are viruses that cause warts. There are over 170 different types. If you've ever had a wart on your, any part of your body, your, your skin, your, your elbow, your knee, your, the bottom of your feet, and so forth, even on your face, it's a human papillomavirus. But some of these are sexually transmitted. In fact, HPVs are the most common sexually transmitted disease in the USA. Some of these infections cause what we call low-risk genital warts. So these are warts that will not proceed to cancer, very much like a wart you might have on your hand, except it happens to be in your genital area. However, there are a number of these viruses, genotypes, that are at high risk for cancers. And these will cause cancers of the cervix, vagina, penis, anus, and the oropharynx. So the, the cervix, vagina, penis, anus, all by sexual activity, oropharynx by, by oral sex, of course. And you do not want to have oral cancer. It's really bad, and they can, sometimes they have to take off your lower jaw in its entirety, all right? So be, be aware of that. 31,000 cases a year of cancers caused by these HPVs, mostly type 16 and 18. So these are the high-risk types. A, a recent study was just released, came out in the Times a couple days ago. It was from a CDC study, and the, the graph is shown here. Nearly half of Americans are infected with HPVs that infect the genitals. That's 18 to 59. You can see all Americans, men 45%, women 40%. So these, these are viruses that begin to be transmitted. So the, the, the ones that cause warts on your skin, you can get those at any time in your life from your parents or from friends or whatever. But the sexually transmitted ones, obviously, uh, begin to be transmitted uh, when you begin sexual activity. So we developed vaccines for these. So you have to hit kids before, I don't know what age, 12 years old. And uh, there are a number of vaccines on the market uh, Gardasil by Merck, type 6, 11, 16, and 18, made in yeast. Another one with more serotypes also in yeast. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline makes its in uh, insect cells. And again, y you should get these before you become sexually active. If you don't, you get infected naturally, and you have a high chance of getting uh, cancers that I told you about. And as you get older, any, any vaccine effectiveness is going down and down because you get mo infected more and more as you get older. So if you haven't had it, please get it because you do not want oral pharyngeal cancer. Now, the way these vaccines are made is to take the gene encoding the capsid protein of HPVs. This is an icosahedral capsid made up of one major capsid protein. The gene it has been cloned. You can produce the protein in either yeast or uh, insect cells. When you produce the protein, it assembles into empty, empty capsids. It's got all the information in it to make an empty capsid. Those are purified, and that's what the vaccine is. It's injected into you. Uh, you generate antibodies, some of which makes their, make their way here to the cervix, to the cervical mucosa, and they can be embedded in the mucus, and they will stop papillomaviruses as they come in. But if you're already infected and your cervical cells are infected, then the, effect, the, the usefulness of the vaccine is much less. I would get it anyway, but um, studies say that it's not as useful. A couple of ideas for future vaccines. Here's a really neat one for flu. You make HA in plants. And if you do that, it actually assembles particles. The HA alone of the flu in plants will make particles. Here's one of them. They have no, uh, no RNAs in them. They only have HA in membrane, but they're quite immunogenic. Uh, and in plants, it's very cheap to do this. You can make 20,000 doses in a square meter of tobacco. This is done in tobacco because it's easy to genetically modify tobacco. 20 cents a dose. So these are in very advanced human trials, and uh, these will probably be licensed very soon. Uh, unfortunately, they have to be injected, so it's not such a leap ahead, but it is a rapid way to 
make a vaccine because let's say a new strain emerges, you can immediately get the sequence of the HA, put it into plants and make the vaccine in a couple of months, whereas to make the traditional egg vaccine it takes from January to August, as I've shown you. Now, subunit vaccines are nice because there's no viral genomes, there's no infectious virus, so they're quite safe. They use modern technology, but they are expensive. They have to be injected, and they're not antigenic. They're poorly antigenic compared to other kinds of vaccines. And that's because the proteins don't replicate. They don't infect cells. They do not cause inflammation. They don't cause cytopathic effect. They don't cause inflammation. And remember, when you don't have inflammation, you don't have a good antibody response. So what we do in some cases is to add chemicals to these vaccines to mimic, to cause inflammation. We call those adjuvants. And a number of adjuvants have been licensed. Uh, they work in two general ways. So these are typically lipid-based materials that are mixed with the vaccine and injected. One way we think is that they hold the antigen, say, in the muscle longer, so it diffuses out much more slowly and it has a longer time, rather than being cleared quickly, it has a longer time to stimulate uh, immune responses. The other is that it, some of the components mixed with these vaccines are actually causing inflammation because they're they're things like toll-like receptor ligands, artificial ligands that are mixed in. So here are three uh, licensed adjuvants. The first one is in the hepatitis B virus vaccine. Remember, those are just empty capsules. They don't replicate. So we put aluminum hydroxide in, and that stimulates inflammation. Uh, one of the um, HPV vaccines has alum and monophosphorolipid A. That's this compound on the right here. Uh, that's a component of bacteria, which happens to be a ligand of TLR4. So it basically binds to TLR4, and that stimulates cytokine production and inflammation, as if this were an infection causing inflammation, but it's not, of course. And then there's another one used only in Europe, MF59, squalene oil and water emulsion. Now, one of the negatives of these adjuvants is that when you get them, you tend to get more pain at the site of injection. What is that pain caused by? Inflammation. So next time you get an injection and it hurts, that's good. It means you're getting inflammation at the injection site. If you're not, then maybe it's not as good. All right, but, but things like adjuvants will do that or an infectious vaccine will cause inflammation as well. So pain is good when it comes to vaccines. But people complain about it all the time, uh, but it means that it's working well. A few interesting things also being developed down the road. This is great, microneedle patch. This is gonna replace needles. These are little pieces of plastic, synthetic, with tiny needles in them. You can just see the needles there. They're small, right? That's a person's finger. And what, it, what happens is the needles are embedded with vaccine. Uh, it's kept frozen. And then when you're ready to be immunized, it's put on your skin, pressed in. The needles push the uh, vaccine just into your dermis. And then they band-aid it onto your skin. It stays there. You don't need a healthcare training to put these on people. They're cheap, no needles, no contamination. This is the way vaccines are going. Remember they said plastics, young man, plastics. Microneedle patches, mark my word, they're gonna be the new thing. We're gonna throw out the freezers. Turns out that adding silk, so here some silk uh, bits here from silkworms, uh, or sugars of various sorts, incredibly thermostabilizes virus particles. So what you do is you mix the silk or the sugar with the virus and then you dry it out and the the silk or the sugar fours a matrix around the particle that completely thermal protects it. So here's an example of uh, these fibers wrapping around virus particles. So here's a cool experiment where we've looked at measles vaccine potency, 45 degrees for different weeks. They've done it at different temperatures. 45C is very hot, right? And so uh, here's the regular measles vaccine in the black squares. Uh, you know, it's, tr it's rapidly losing potency just a few weeks at uh, 45 it's over half gone, which is not good at all. You will not get a good protective immune response. But look, with, uh, I don't know if it's silk or sugar in this experiment, 45 degrees, it's pretty much maintaining its near 100% near potency for 25 weeks at 45 C. So that means you don't need a refrigerator to store these anymore. This is gonna come on the market as well. These will have to be tested to make sure they're immunogenic and protective. But I think these technologies are gonna revolutionize uh, vaccine. I also mentioned, um, 
universal flu vaccines. That is, can we make a flu vaccine that you get once in your life and it protects you against any strain that might ever emerge for the rest of your life? A lot of people are working on this. And one of the approaches is to, is to take the stem of the HA. Here's the HA again. Remember, the epitopes on the head vary a lot. And that's what our vaccine currently is, is uh, eliciting antibodies against. But uh, very few antibodies are made uh, induced by vaccines against these stem region epitopes, which are very conserved. They don't change very much. But people do have these epitopes in them. They have antibodies against them. And they are broadly neutralizing. So people are trying to figure out how to induce antibodies to these stem region epitopes. And some of the approaches include making headless HA molecules. You take the head off, against which most of the antibody response is directed. And now it's directed at the stem. And again, these are also in trials. And you'll see more of this uh, emerging over the next few years. So it's possible that you won't have to get a, a flu vaccine every year. Now, it doesn't take care of the issue that older people don't have good memory. That's another issue that has to be taken care of. All right, uh, our other question today, what are some requirements for an effective vaccine? Low cost, ease of administration, pro provides long lasting immunity, minimal side effects, all of the above. The answer is E, 100%. Now you set a record in this class. How many did we get 100%? Four or five, do you remember? That's the standard for the future. All right, let's talk about uh, infectious, or what we call attenuated vaccines. Here you take a virus that's infectious, it causes disease, and then you modify it some way so it no longer causes disease. Typically this involves making genetic alterations to it. These are interesting because the virus replicates, you get good immunity, it mimics a natural infection, except it doesn't cause disease, either mild or in apparent disease. Uh, the idea is that for an activated vaccine, typically you need multiple boosts or doses to get a good immune response. You know, the first one isn't quite enough, but a second or third uh, sometimes does it. And that's certainly the case for many of our inactivated vaccines. You need more than one shot. But a replication competent vaccine replicates, and therefore you need just one shot in theory. It will replicate and boost immunity, and you get a nice immune response. How do you make these? Well, in the old days, you know, leading to the uh, the first, well, actually, the first infectious attenuated human vaccine was yellow fever vaccine uh, made in the 40s right here at Rockefeller University, uh, followed by the polio vaccine. You take a virus and you simply pass it in different kinds of cells. So here they're passing the virus, which is a human virus, in monkey cells, over and over in monkey cells. And the idea is you adapt the virus, or you select for viruses that are really good at, at growing in monkey cells, and then maybe when you put them back in human cells, they don't grow as well, they don't cause disease, but they still cause an immune response. Yes, this is an empirical approach. It's hit or miss, and that's how the, the polio vaccine was developed. So today we have an infectious attenuated flu vaccine called flu mist. This is a uh, virus that is intranasally administered. You take a little bit of the virus, and in fact, it comes prepackaged in a syringe without the needle, of course. Just put the syringe in the nose. You, you, uh, you squeeze it while they inhale, goes into the nasopharynx, replicates in the mucosa, and makes pretty good immunity. It has all the A and B strains that we've talked about, the exact composition as we've talked about. We use reassortants of master donor strains. But the donor strain, in this case, have particular properties that were selected a long time ago. They're cold adapted and temperature sensitive and attenuated. So what do these things mean? Cold adapted means they replicate much better in the upper tract where the temperature is lower. They don't tend to replicate in the lung, and that's good because that, if they did there, they would be more likely to cause disease. Temperature sensitive, again, prevents them from replicating in the lower tract. And attenuated means in ferrets models of flu, they were shown not to cause disease. Of course, these have all been uh, trialed in humans and they're safe as well. These replicate only in the upper tract and give protective immunity. If you have a choice ever, I would pick this vaccine. I think it most closely mimics a natural infection and gives you the best long-lasting immunity. Unfortunately, they run out of it very quickly because only one company uh, makes it every year and they don't make a lot of doses. We also have infectious attenuated vaccines for polio. It's called the Sabin oral polio virus vaccine or OPV. And this virus you take orally. It replicates in your mucosal cells. It immunizes your gut. You get secretory immunity in your gut. Also gets to the blood. You get antibodies in the blood as well. And you're fully protected. 
against challenge. When you are challenged with a wild virus, uh, the virus never gets past your gut. It doesn't replicate in your gut. You don't shed it. It never gets to your bloodstream. And that's, in, in that way, it's different from IPV, remember, which only pr protects your blood. So OPV immunizes your gut and prevents transmission of the virus. OPV was used, introduced in the US uh, in 1962. You know, we'd been using IPV for uh, six years, seven years or so, but people thought, well, there's still a few, case, few thousand cases left. Maybe this is not the vaccine to eradicate this virus. So uh, they switch, we switched to the OPV, and now we've eradicated uh, polio from the US. The way this vaccine was made, uh, Albert Sabin took the three serotypes of polio, types one, two, and three, and he just passed them in different cells, different hosts, did plaque purifications, uh, thousands and thousands of animals he used. And at each passage, he would take a little virus and put it in an animal and ask, have I selected for a virus that's lost its neurovirulence? And in the end, he got that what he wanted. He got three viruses, which if you put right into the brain or right into the spinal cord of a monkey, no paralysis whatsoever. And then, this was in the 1950s, he tested those on his wife and his three daughters because that was the way you did things back then. If you felt you had something good for the population, well, damn it, you better check it on your own self and your own family. <laughs> and they were fine, and then it, got, it went on to bigger and bigger clinical trials. Here's another practice which they used to do. After his family, what do you think was next? What population was next? Not students, no, no. Prisoners and mentally retarded children. They would go into institutions and, you know, which we, of course we don't do, it's not ethical to do that anymore. But uh, then they would go into the, the larger populations. So these were licensed in 1961. Uh, in the 80s, when we got the ability to sequence genomes, we learned what mutations he had selected for. There aren't very many in the three serotypes, five, two, and two. Uh, in, and these are the mutations that make this vaccine unable to cause disease in human, unable to cause paralysis. In fact, look at these three. They have one in the five prime non-coding region. And we've mentioned this before when we talked about virulence determinants in non-coding regions. Here's the polio genome. The five prime non-coding region appears the internal ribosome entry site. Uh, Sabin selected for mutations all within this stem loop five here. You can see it's ex expanded on the right. The type one, the type two, and the type three mutations, there they are, amazing, all in the same place. Now again, these single point mutations make this virus unable to cause a disease in people. Unfortunately, they revert. A vaccine with two mutations cannot be licensed nowadays. Back then, we didn't realize it only had two mutations, but if you tried to license a vaccine, the FDA would say, go home, go back to work. Here's the first experiment done to show that reversion. Phil Miner was a Picorna virologist in the UK. I knew very well. And his first son, David Miner, he took all of his diapers and brought them to work after he got the polio vaccine. So David got the polio vaccine, which has a U at 472. And then at 24 hours after immunization, the, 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 his uh, feces contained polio with still a U. 31 hours, still a U. But look, at 35 hours, it's reverting. And at 47 hours, uh, the type 3 polio is reverted. This virus would cause paralysis if you stuck it in a monkey. David Miner was fine. And in fact, this occurs in every kid who gets polio vaccine. They're fine, except for one in one and a half million, which unfortunately do get paralyzed from having uh, this virus reverting in them. But we think that the reversion is in fact part of the, uh, the reason this, this vaccine does well. So I was always interested in those one in one and a half million kids who get paralysis from the polio vaccine. I always wanted to do a G-wash on them and find what mutations they have in their innate immune system that uh, makes them susceptible, but I could never do that. So these are the cases of polio in the US from 61 to 2003. The line is the total number of cases you see declining rapidly after the 60s. Last case of polio in the US, 1979, caused by wild virus. These bars, though, are vaccine-caused polio cases. They're kids 7 to 10 to 12 every year who get polio from the vaccine. You can see the number of the bars here. And, and that's why in 2000 we switched back to IPV, because there was no longer any threat for wild-type polio. The risk could not be justified of getting polio from the vaccine. So now we have no polio uh, in the US. Now, unfortunately, most of the eradication effort is using OPV still. Well, WHO in 1988 said, we're going to eradicate polio by 2005. 
and stop polio immunization. Well, we're a little beyond this. They've done pretty well, though. Let me give you an update. First of all, can you eradicate a disease? Well, the answer is yes. Smallpox was eradicated. And you need two features to eradicate a virus. It can only, it can only have one host, and, and you have to have lifelong immunity from vaccination. So both smallpox and polio fit the bill. So in 1988, we had 125 polio endemic countries. Those are the dark red ones. 10 years later, 40 polio endemic countries. Another 10 years, five polio endemic countries. Now today we have three. The only countries where we have not eliminated wild type polio, Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Every other country has eliminated wild polio. However, all right, look at the numbers here. This is at the end of 2016, 20 cases of wild polio. But look, three cases of vaccine-derived polio. So the orange dots are cases of vaccine-derived <coughs> polio viruses, which crop up all over where people allow immunization to drop, and then the vaccine-derived strains, which are constantly being introduced into the population because we're using OPV to eradicate globally end up being a problem. So WHO is realizing this and they're slowly switching essentially to uh, IPV. But remember, if you eradicate a virus, any virus, as long as you have the sequence, and we have the sequence of every virus against which we vaccinate, you could make it again. You could just synthesize the genome and make it. And that goes for polio with a seven and a half KB genome to smallpox you know, with a 280 KB genome. Someone has just synthesized a horsepox virus for vaccine purposes, huge, can be done. So I don't know, eradication is a, is a concept only. It could still be reversed. Let me end up by talking a little bit about um, using engineering recombinant DNA to make new vaccines. And this starts with yellow fever. That was the first human virus identified way back in 1901. We identified it because uh, it was causing problems to the construction of the Panama Canal. Mosquitoes there were transmitting. It's transmitted to Aedes aegypti. And uh, the disease is very serious, fever and nausea at its, at its low end to failure of organ systems, including your liver, so you become jaundiced. That's why it was originally called yellow fever. Back in 1938, Max Tyler at Rockefeller made a vaccine called 17D. He passaged uh, the virulent yellow fever virus 176 times in chick embryo tissue culture. He just kept passing it and passing it. At each pass, he would take a little and see if it was virulent in an animal model. And if it wasn't, he would go back. And by 176, it, was, it had lost its virulence uh, by passaging in chick. This vaccine was since licensed. We've released over 100, 500 million doses. It's a safe and effective vaccine. As I said, if you travel to a yellow fever endemic country, you will get uh, Max Tyler's 17D yellow fever vaccine. It's an infectious attenuated virus that's injected into your muscle. Now, uh, yellow fever, of course, is a flavivirus. It has a plus-stranded RNA genome that encodes a polyprotein. The virus consists of the plus-stranded RNA in an icosahedral capsid surrounded by a membrane with glycoproteins in the membrane. Now, a number of years ago, the genome of the 17D yellow fever vaccine strain was cloned as a piece of DNA, and you could then take that DNA, put it back in cells, and get virus back. So what was done more recently was to replace uh, the structural proteins, the PRM and E, E being the glycoprotein, and, and PRM being the part through the membrane. They replaced it with the sequence from dengue virus. Dengue's in the same family, so this should work. Why make an attenuated dengue vaccine when you already have a yellow fever when you could just slot in the, yellow, the dengue virus proteins? So that vaccine was made, in fact, it's just been licensed, it's called Dengvaxia. There's a box for it. And uh, it's not offered in the US, it's been licensed in Mexico, Brazil, and the Philippines. It's four different dengue virus serotypes, the capsid proteins of those put in the yellow fever backbone. Now, the problem with this vaccine is it doesn't protect against dengue two. And when kids two to nine years old are immunized, they actually get worse disease. So you can't give it to those kids at all. So this is not a perfect vaccine, yet you know, Sanofi put billions of dollars into it. So they want it licensed, and it was licensed, and it's being used. But there's a better vaccine in the pipeline, and it's called TV003. This was developed at the NIH. Here they take dengue virus, 
the whole dengue virus, the native dengue virus, uh, virus and make a, a, an infectious DNA from it. And then they make a mutation in the three prime non-coding region. That turns out to completely attenuate virus pathogenesis. And um, so it's, this is a tetravalent attenuated vaccine produced by mutagenesis. They gave one dose to people in a clinical trial. It got 100% protection, really effective. So this is going into further clinical trials. So what's different about this? Well, one of the ideas is that by just using the dengue E and PRM proteins, you, you, didn't ha you don't have all the epitopes from all the non-structural proteins from dengue. And maybe you need those to have really good immunity, especially in young kids or against type 2 and so forth. So here, this vaccine candidate has, is pure dengue. It's not dengue slotted into yellow fever, and that might be why it's better. So this one, I think, looks very good. This may end up being uh, licensed eventually. It's going to take some time to go through phase 2 and 3, but it may replace uh, denvaxia. I mention that because it's a great, a great example of how you can use genetic engineering. You take an infectious clone of a virus, make mutations, identify ones that attenuate the virus, you can make a vaccine out of it. So let's end up talking about Zika vaccines. There's a ton of them being developed now. This is a Flavy virus also, yellow fever and dengue. First isolated in 1947 in Uganda. But for the next 50 years, caused, caused hardly any cases globally. It slowly spread through Africa, spread uh, through Asia, and really a handful of cases, less than 50 cases in the next 50 years until it reached uh, the Pacific. There was an outbreak on Yap Island in 2007. Uh, this is a population of 8,000 people. 73% um, of the population was infected. First, the first big outbreak ever, and then it spread throughout the um, Pacific, eventually made its way to Brazil, where it was associated with microcephaly, and then it became uh, recognized on the world stage. But for many years, not doing anything. Now this virus, as far as we knew, caused a mild rash fever, joint pain, conjunctivitis, headache type syndrome, very similar to dengue and chick with a short incubation period and rare fatalities. And something obviously happened when uh, it started entering fetuses. We now know that infection is associated with a number of central nervous system complications. In adults, Guillain-Barre syndrome, acute myelitis, encephalopathy, Meningoencephalitis, these are all relatively rare in adults, but in infants, of course, born to mothers who are infected mainly in the first and, se and second trimesters, they can be born with a range of defects, uh, including microcephaly, lysencephaly, and macular atrophy. But there are other defects as well. Now there's, there's good evidence that after birth, many kids who look fine are developing cognitive defects as a consequence of having virus uh, in the CNS. By the way, uh, by, by being infected with Zika in utero, Many people feel that the virus mutated in order to acquire these new properties. I don't think so. In our lab, we've been doing work on it, which suggests that the virus always had this ability to infect neural culture since 1947. And we probably just didn't see these complications uh, in the other countries where it was spreading. Now, these are all the vaccines that are being developed against Zika virus. There's a huge uh, outpouring of interest by labs and pharmaceutical companies. They're making attenuated vaccines, inactivated vaccines, recombinant DNA vaccines of various sorts, uh, DNA vaccines alone. Over 15 different vaccines are now in phase one trials and more in development. It's really remarkable. So let me walk you through a couple of those. Uh, one of them that's very interesting is a DNA virus vaccine or a DNA vaccine. Uh, what they have done is they've taken the DNA encoding the PRM and E proteins put it in a plasmid, and then the DNA is simply injected into the muscle. As I said, that DNA is picked up by antigen presenting cells, which are good cells to be pre uh, producing antigens, right? They'll then uh, present it to T cells in the lymph node, uh, and you get a very good immune response. And so this has been tested in mice. So here on the top right are a number, 10 different mice who have received a, uh, a, just a vector DNA inoculation. They're, not, they're then challenged with Zika virus. The virus makes a viremia in them. Um, so th these are wild type mice in which you get a viremia, but you don't get any disease. You get a peak of viremia, as you can see, uh, and then resolved, and, and there's no fatality. But if you uh, immunize these animals with the DNA vaccine encoding PRM and, and the E, like a protein, uh, no viremia in any of the mice. So that's 
that's the basis for this going into phase one in people to test safety. And that will probably move forward as well. Um, here's another vaccine that's being developed, which uses vesicular stomatitis virus to express uh, the E protein of Zika. So on the bottom is Zika virus. There's the E coding region. And what they do is they take vesicular stomatitis virus, which not really a human pathogen. It can infect people under certain conditions, but it's an animal virus that has been shown to be safe in people as a vector. So you take the, the glycoprotein gene of VSV, which is here, the, the G protein, and you substitute it for the, uh, with the E glycoprotein of Zika virus. So now you have what we call a pseudotyped virus. It's VSV producing the glycoprotein of uh, Zika virus. And this has also been shown to be protective in mouse models as well. It'll go into uh, anim human trials also. Just this morning, a new paper came out, which I stuck in at the last minute. And a live attenuated Zika virus vaccine candidate induces sterilizing immunity in mouse models. So what they did here, here's the Zika virus genome. Here's the three prime, and they introduced a variety of deletions in the three prime non-coding region. You can see 10 bases, 20 bases, two different 30 base deletions. And it turns out that uh, one of these, I think it was the 20 base or the 10, uh, replicates quite well, doesn't cause disease, and when you immunize mice uh, with these, uh, they're protected against Zika infection. Now this is the same strategy used to make TV003, that new dengue vaccine, a mutation in the three prime non-coding region, attenuates the virus and makes it a good vaccine candidate. So a lot of activity in Zika. I think it's unprecedented in part because of its role in microcephaly and other birth defects. It's mosquito transmitted, so you really can't control uh, when you get it or not. So we'll see these come to market in the next five years or so. But most likely, you won't be getting this. We don't have Zika here in the US, except a little bit in Florida and Texas, because that's really the only places where Aedes aegypti circulate. We don't have them up here in New York City. We haven't had them in New York for 50 years. So the only Zika cases we have are imported. People get infected elsewhere and bring the disease back, but it's not transmitted among people because there's no vector for infection. So for us, uh, these vaccines will be travel vaccines, like yellow fever. Eventually, the dengue vaccine will be a travel vaccine for us. You know, if you want to go to places where the virus is endemic and you don't want to get dengue hemorrhagic fever, you'll get it as well. But it's very interesting that you know, development has really surged forward. It's not gonna help us all that much, but I think that's great. I think it's great that we can help other countries in the world that have a Zika problem and can't develop their own vaccines.